gracious Heavenly Father, I just uh, come before you today just asking your blessing upon this video and all those that hear it. I just ask that you would take and just uh, seal to our heart only that which is true and just filter out all of the error. We are so grateful and thankful for the privilege and the opportunity that you've given us to do what we are doing here and to fellowship with one another over your word, the study of your word. And I ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We've been studying together in the epistle to the Colossians verse by verse. And in our last study together, we ended the first chapter and we kind of took a glimpse at the second chapter. And we, we ended the first chapter looking at the word mystery, which is uh, biblically speaking is a truth that can't be known unless it's revealed by God. A truth that can only be known by revelation. And one of the things of great importance to the Holy Spirit being that being the mystery, the revelation of Christ in you, the certainty of glory. That's not you in Christ. That's not what the text says. It's Christ in you, our certainty of glory. Not your faithfulness, not what you do or what you don't do, but Christ in you. It is, in fact, a work of, of God in the 28th and the 29th verses. And this being the burden of the work of the Holy Spirit through men like Paul. I spent some time, you know, we, we spent some time looking at the admonitions and the instructions. And I suggested to you that these were not open-ended statements of the Holy Spirit where that we could just fill in the blanks. You know, like, you know, I ought to warn you not to uh, commit adultery, you know, uh, to stay out of bars, or, you know, warn you not to lie, steal, or whatever things that you just want to write in there. That this is not the subject that the Holy Spirit is addressing in these particular passage of, of, uh, passages of Scripture right here. Since the subject of our study, the context, the context has to do with the person and the work of Christ, not us. And so now we enter into the second chapter. But before we begin, I'd like to, to take just a, a few moments just to speak to you all uh, personally from the heart. I want all of you out here that are listening to me, I want you all to know just how great a struggle that I have on behalf of those who follow this channel, who, uh, who have not personally met me in real life, that you all might be encouraged in the love which we have for one another because of the full assurance that, that we've been given by God concerning the person and the work of Jesus Christ. How great a struggle and how great a struggle that I have on behalf of all of you that, that no one will persuade you, entice you, beguile you with other words that sound reasonable, they sound logical, they sound rational, to believe anything other than what Christ did for us. That to believe anything other than the fact that what He did was sufficient. And that because I am with you all in spirit, I rejoice over your steadfastness of faith. When I read your comments, I rejoice over those comments. So. Let's now go on and, and just read the first five chapters of chapter 2. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ.
Did that sound familiar? Folks, I want to simply ask you all now to think it through that the Apostle Paul was to these believers in a way similar to how the Holy Spirit is to us and in a, in a way similar to how we ourselves are to one another. I recognize the fact that Paul was concerned for these believers, but we are in fact looking at words spoken by the Holy Spirit to every generation that it is the Holy Spirit who says, I want you to know this. It's not a subjunctive, the mood of uncertainty. It's an indicative. It reads in the English as though I wish you to know. But what the text says is, it is my will that you know what great agony I have for you, for those at Laodicea, and in fact, as many as haven't seen my face in the flesh. Now, I recognize that these are, are words penned by Paul, but I believe that we're looking at the heart of God. The Holy Spirit has spoken through Paul, and it, it is the Holy Spirit who says, I want you to know that I have great conflict. I have great agony for you. The Greek word is the word agony. To agonize as one agonizes you know, in a, in a game of sports or, or in war, in combat. The first thing I want you to see is that it is the purpose of the Holy Spirit. It, it, for us to know this, it is inconceivable that any Christian could stand before God someday and say, God, Lord, I didn't know that. Right there it is. Page something in your Bible. And it wouldn't be there if God didn't will that you know it. Secondly, I want you to see that there's conflict involved. Now, folks, I, I take a stronger stand on the sovereign majesty, the power of Almighty God than, than most people that I know. But I would not in any way want you to believe that because of that, I don't recognize that there are other powers. God's absolute plan, program will not, cannot be changed. Satan will be defeated. But to suggest that he has no power is anti-biblical. God is involved in a struggle for he willed to show his wrath against sin. And in willing to show his wrath against sin, there is a resultant conflict. There is a conflict in the world that surrounds us that goes on 24-7. I also have to acknowledge the fact that there is a conflict that it is intrinsic with our own nature, our own flesh. The flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. Which I believe, that's, that's, that's what the, I believe led the prophet Isaiah to say, O Lord, why hast thou made us to err from thy ways? Isaiah 63. And so there's not only the spiritual warfare that surrounds every one of us, but there is the never-ending conflict between flesh and spirit. And that conflict is for all of God's children. I believe the Holy Spirit is making it clear that the conflict is not only for those at, at Colossae, Laodicea, but for all of God's family. That conflict centers around a very distinct purpose in order that in order that their hearts might be comforted now i want you to let that sink in for a moment please if i didn't know folks that that verse was there i would have thought that that conflict would would much more be involved with how i lived and how i served and and what i did and if i did things right or you know, do, do all, doing all the things right, not doing all the things that are wrong and, and all of that stuff. Not that I don't think service is important. If I didn't believe that it's important to serve the Lord, I wouldn't be doing this. I believe ser service, you know, uh, ministry uh, is important. Woe is me if I don't teach the truth. There's a constraint that God has placed upon me to teach what I believe to be the truth of the Word of God. So I believe service is important, 
I believe your conduct is important. I just don't believe that to be the primary subject of our present study. The great conflict that God is revealing here is a conflict that your heart might be comforted. Please, let that sink in. Now, that's not what I would have written, you know, had I been the author. You know, when I, and when I stand back and I look at what is called Christianity today, it is not a source of comfort to my heart. Modern Christianity defines this conflict differently. You know, in the sense that we war against the flesh, trying to clean up the old man, the unchangeable old man, trying to dress up a corpse. And there's no area of conflict any greater than the area of religion. So, you know, there's argument and there's division and human pride and, and all of the rest of that junk. You know, there's this splinter group going one way and that splinter group going the other way and, and people using religion and the gospel of Christ for as a means of raising funds or, or for personal advancement, you know, who knows what. I look around and, and I think nothing that God seems to have purposed is working out in order that their hearts might be comforted. You know, like, well, you know, you ought to be knit together in love, but you're not. You know, you ought to learn these things, but that is not what the, the text says, folks. That's not what the verse says. The text is telling us we are knit together, joined together in love. And because that be true, we ought to be comforted. Some of you have no idea how the Holy Spirit works through you in my life. You know, the things that you say, the comments you make, the questions that you ask, the way that you direct my thinking and my study. And I don't believe that that's you. I believe it's the Holy Spirit. And, and, and in many cases, you don't have any idea that you're doing it. And the reverse may be also true. The Spirit working through me. Do you suppose the work of the Holy Spirit is a work of defeat? having been joined together. This is a passive, it's an aorist. This is not uh, an, some exhortation that you ought to be joined together in love. This is not an urging you to get involved in some, some kind of Christian love so that we'll have a greater unity among Christians. Folks, this is a statement of fact, an accomplished fact. Their hearts have been joined together in love. That's what God's done. And we have great appeals today, you know, for the unity of the body, body of Christ, you know, that, that we might be one, that we might all be unified. Father, I pray that they may be one as we are one, and we have preachers getting up and saying, well, you know, that hadn't happened yet, so, you know, we, we need to really need to get together. We ought to work together, so it will. Folks, if God didn't answer Christ's prayers, then what chance do I have? You know, it seems to me that any serious student of the Word knows that anything that Christ prayed was answered. If Christ prayed it, it's done. I pray that they may be one. And here we read, our hearts have been joined together in love. We didn't do it. We didn't do it. There's no exhortation, no, no admonishment here, you know, for you to whip up some kind of fakey love. There's no urging here that we don't love each other enough, you know, that we are to somehow love so that our lives will be this great testimony for Christ. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't love one another. Please don't misunderstand me. What I'm saying is that's not the subject of this verse. This verse is a marvelous statement of an accomplished fact. Having been knit together in love and unto all Riches of the full assurance of understanding. Understanding of what? To the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. One of the things that God accomplished in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ is that you and I have been joined together in love. It's an aorist passive. 
in order that their heart may be comforted. The knitted together in love is done. It's not something in the process of being done. You didn't do it. God did. So whatever comfort a Christian has, and I, I put that word comfort in quotes, is not some kind of comfort that we whip up. It's tied directly to our being joined together in love. Verse 2 in the original text literally states that may be encouraged, that is comforted, the hearts of them having been knit together in love and to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to, that's experiential knowledge, epigonosco, of the mystery of God, Christ. That's, that's a direct statement of Christ Himself being God, God Almighty, incarnate. What is the full knowledge of the revelation of God, Christ? We were just told that in, that in chapter 1. Christ in you, the certainty, the hope of glory. That's what this text says. What is the work of the Holy Spirit? That you would have full knowledge of the revelation of God, which is Christ. We are surrounded by bodies of Christians who call themselves spiritual, and they're involved in spirit ministry, the very thing that the Word of God says that the Holy Spirit won't do. He will not speak of Himself, but He shall speak of me. The work of the Holy Spirit, the agonizing conflict of the Holy Spirit is the full knowledge of the revelation of God, which is Christ. Our comfort rests in what Christ did. God has given us this comfort. It's not found in something that we do. Our lives aren't governed by emotions like you know, well, I'm redeemed because I feel like I'm redeemed. Or, I'm redeemed because I did something. Or, I have joy because, because I did something. I'm comforted because I did something. This is a theological comfort. It's based on what Christ did for us. All of the knowledge that God wants you to have is in His revelation concerning Christ. It's not saying that we possess all understanding all wisdom, but that we have all the knowledge God wants us to have, everything that we need to know about the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, God has told us. And so we have to know what God has told us. We have to know this book. And personally, I believe one of the greatest problems among Christian educational institutions today is that Bible study is mainly conducted by curricula manuals, questionnaires, you know, books written by people rather than God's Word because that's, well, that's just too hard to understand. That's too confusing. Or that's too divisive. Apparently, God doesn't know how to write, or, you know, if God does, people don't know how to translate. And so we have a fantastic book ministry built up, and Christians by the score are becoming mirrors of the author's opinions instead of mirrors of the author of this book. Yeah, well, I can hear it now, but Steve, we come here and listen to you. Yeah, and I trust that you'll find time to study the text to see if what I'm teaching is the truth. No man has a corner on truth. You know, I wonder why I have the nerve to do this, you know, except by the grace of God. But you're not looking at paragraphs, folks, that I wrote. You're looking at words the Holy Spirit wrote. We need to slow down a bit and read these words carefully. Verse 3, In whom are revealed all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. No. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Present active. We're no longer... Not revealed, hidden. 
hid in Christ, folks. Don't, don't let that one fact escape your notice. We're no longer looking at accomplished fact. We're now looking at enduring reality. They have always and will continue to be centered in Christ. All of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge have been placed in Christ. You know, I think we'd like Scripture better, you know, if it said uh, there's a good possibility that God will always cause you to triumph. But, but folks, God never speaks in terms like that. He always causes you to triumph. He always gives you the victory. In whom are hid, not some, not many, not even most, but all of the riches, the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And that says that there's no other place to look. Which kind of helps explain one of the great criticisms of Christianity. You know, that we're not willing to recognize the existence and the re reliability of so-called other religions. That, you know, that there are many approaches to God. There's only one place to look for the wisdom of God and the knowledge of God. And that's in the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't say in the Spirit. It doesn't say in God the Father. It's in the incarnation. God Almighty, incarnate, in human flesh, in the work and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I get the idea from the word hidden that, that they are something that I must study to find out, that I'm to be eager, give diligence to, to, to find out, to learn. To make my calling and election sure. Be eager to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And why should God purposely require study and discipline and diligence? So that we can, what? Be all that we can be? No, no. No, we didn't enlist in the army, folks. It's so that we will be comforted that's why he wants you to work hard at studying not so that you'll do everything right not so that you'll be the best that you can be it's so that you'll come to understand that Christ what he did on our behalf was sufficient that we would be comforted God's not asking you to become involved in, uh, in any kind of activity that would accomplish the end result. He's telling you that it's done. The conflict of the Holy Spirit is that we understand the truth of what God has done for us in Christ. And those truths are hidden in Christ. And we know Christ is truth. We have to give due diligence to understand them, to find them out, to comprehend these truths, to comprehend that which is already true of Him and us. As we learn more and more of the treasures and the wisdom and the knowledge uh, of Jesus Christ, we see more and more that it's not about us at all, folks. It's about Him. You know, a good measuring unit, a good yardstick of, of how much one has studied those treasures of wisdom and knowledge is how much human merit remains in the theology of the individual. We need to understand these truths because they will stand against the storms, the, the wind, the, the rain. It'll stand against all the parallel logic and the human reasonings that come in alongside your life in, in, in these truths where that the real truth is maligned. To be comforted by these truths that you would know where it would be impossible for somebody to bring in parallel logic, human merit, alongside these precious truths. You know, like God helps those who help themselves. Parallel logic. You won't find that reference in the Bible anywhere. Uh, cleanliness is next to godliness. I, yeah, that's why I had to take a bath twice a year or, or, or whenever my mother decided I needed to. Parallel logic. Somebody writes a book touting some new formula that, man, if you just follow these steps, you know, uh, it, it'll take you to Christian maturity. Parallel reasoning. 
parallel logic. It sounds good. I admit, it sounds good. God says, I want you to know that you are not earning this position through enticing words of human wisdom. The word enticing is a combination of two Greek words. I say this in order that nobody would be able to persuade you with words that are reasonings alongside the truth. They look like they're headed in the same direction, folks. You know, personal sanctification, personal righteousness, merit with God, the blessing from God, and so forth. They all look like they're headed the same way, but it all leads to, wrong, to the, the wrong motive. I want you to know something so that you won't be led down that path, is what God says. That is, that you can have comfort in the fact that you are joined together in love, not only with one another, but with Christ. Let me take a moment to say just how much I really do appreciate all of your correspondence, all of your emails, your, your messages that you leave. I try to read every one that I can. How much that I really just, I, I, don't, I don't really have the words to describe just what you, you people mean to me. And I appreci so appreciate you all. And I love you all dearly. I love you. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.